Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be continuing our discussion of trusses, uh, and this is the second video, the second lecture, where we explore basic truss theory. So in this video, we'll be continuing our look at uh, the equations of determinacy and stability, discussing both uh, internal and external determinacy, uh, looking at whether a uh, whether a truss can you can whether you, on a truss you can solve for all of the external reactions and internal forces using statics alone, and also exploring external versus internal stability. Uh, finally, we'll be looking at types of trusses, including simple, compound, and complex trusses, and then we'll wrap up by looking at some special. Uh, uh, force conditions, including the uh, equal force members and zero force members. So for truss determinacy and stability, M is going to be equal to our number of members in the truss. Uh, so our number of truss members. Uh, R is going to be equal to the number of reactions. And what I mean by number of reactions is a, a pin support will give you two, and a roller support will give you one. So if you have a truss like this, you know, a very simple truss like this, well, actually, let's say it's something like a pin, a simply supported truss. If you have something like this, your R would be equal to three. However, if you had something like this, where are your trusses, where your truss is supported by two uh, pin supports, this would be R is equal to four. Or you could even have something, um, maybe more of a continuous truss, like this. Here, R would be equal to six. Okay, and again, as we recall from last time, uh, these M and R essentially represent our unknowns. M and R represent our number of unknowns. And then we have equations uh, to solve for these unknowns. Uh, the number of equations we have is going to be equal to twice the number of joints. And again, this is for a two-dimensional system, uh, not a three-dimensional system. A three-dimensional system, three system, each joint would give you uh, three uh, equations of equilibrium, but for a two, for a planar two-dimensional truss, uh, J is going to be our number of joints, and each one of these is going to give us two equations of equilibrium. Okay, so in terms of our equations, now the M plus R is equal to two J. That is correct. That one was correct. Uh, when M plus R is equal to two J. Here you have a determinant and stable truss. However, uh, consider what happens when you have uh, fewer unknowns than your uh, equations. So in other words, let's say you have two reactions. You just have two roller supports, for example. Um, in that case, and, and you had a truss that was uh, also, uh, you had a number of members that made it so that R was still n plus R was still less than two J. In this case, your your truss is still determinant. Uh, however, it will be unstable. And in terms of equations, we can also there's a couple ways to interpret this. We can interpret this in terms of um, tr overall truss behavior, like stability and uh, a stability and behavior and internal forces, or we can interpret this mathematically. And so if you get a, um, if you have an equation like this, so for a unstable truss like this, when you try, when you try to solve for all the M plus R's, um, what you will end up getting after you collapse it down, you will get no unique solution. In other words, after you collapse everything down, you might get something, you'll get a simple equality like four equals four or three equals three. It will be possible to write the equations in a manner that they simply, 
that all of the forces simply cancel out. And so if this is this is sort of like uh, if you think of the um, a simple algebraic example, this would be like the case of two lines that are right on top of each other. So um, you can solve for all the internal forces. However, um, you will find that there are places you can take moments about, for example, that where no forces are present, and so you'll end up with things like this. Okay, so um, then if you have m plus r is greater than 2j, this is where you have a truss that is still stable, but it's indeterminate. And for the uh, indeterminate truss, you will have a truss that you cannot solve any solution for. So for uh, the indeterminate truss here, where m plus r is greater than 2j, you will not be able to get a solution. You will usually be able to get uh, You'll be able to get simple um, relations between the, ver between the various forces often. For example, you might find that AX equals 3AY or something like that. Um, and you'll be able to find basic relationships or ratios. Uh, you'll often be able to find uh, basic relationships and uh, ratios between the various forces, um, between the various reactions and internal forces, but you will not be able to arrive at a solution. And that's because, so again, um, Sorry if that was a little bit a little bit confused at the end there. This is correct. If you have m plus r is equal to 2j, you have a determinate and stable truss. If m plus r is less than 2j, you have a determinate and unstable truss. And when m plus r is greater than 2j, you have a st uh, stable but indeterminate truss. So, any questions on this? Okay. So, I would also like to discuss uh, types of determinacy and stability and then look at some types of trusses, and then maybe look at some zero force members and some other aspects of truss theory. So yeah, just go ahead and uh, correct your earlier notes if you could. And so, sorry about that. I do try not to make any errors in my lectures. That's something you definitely strive for. But if I do, I try to always uh, correct myself. And life lesson, never be afraid to correct yourself. So next we want to look at types of determinacy and stability. So I want to be able to explore, I want to be able to label uh, not only if a truss is determinate and in, or indeterminate, but to what degree it is indeterminate. So degrees of indeterminacy. So degrees of indeterminacy. And again, we will have an, the case of an indeterminate truss again, think about this, is where m plus r is greater than 2j. In other words, our unknowns, our unknown number of forces and reactions are greater than our number of equations of equilibrium. So number of unknowns is greater than our number of equations of equilibrium. And so, uh, if you want to uh, determine the degree of indeterminacy, the overall indeterminacy, the overall degree of indeterminacy for an indeterminate truss is simply going to be the uh, subtraction of the two. 
So it's going to be uh, that it would simply be m plus r minus 2j. So if you have, let's say you have 11 members, example, 11 members, uh, let's say you have four uh, support forces or reaction forces, maybe on two different supports. And let's say you have, oh, I don't know, uh, seven joints. Uh, seven joints. Well, in this case, uh, M would be equal to 11. Uh, so you have M equals 11. You have uh, R equals to 4. And you have J equal to 7. So your degree of indeterminacy in this simple case would simply be uh, the subtraction. So m plus r minus 2j, that is 11 plus 4 uh, minus 2 times 7. So that would come to uh, 15 and then 14, so 1. So I would say this truss, um, this truss would be indeterminate uh, to the first degree. or a first degree indeterminacy. Also, there is external versus internal uh, indeterminacy. So the external uh, determinacy is determined simply by, is found simply by uh, treating the, or, or can be expressed as, maybe I can write it like this, external determinacy, if I can manage to write the word external correctly, uh, the external determinacy uh, measures whether uh, all reactions, can all reactions be found, uh, so it measures uh, whether all reactions can be found, or we are asking the question, can all reactions be found Uh, when treating the truss as a single rigid body. So in other words, we're not cutting it, we're not uh, taking a section of it, we're not isolating the joints. Um, we are simply treating it as a, symbol, a single rigid body and trying to solve for all of the reactions. So if that is the case, um, and so the ex and then we, then you're applying a balance of forces, balance of moments. And so the external determinacy for a 2D truss would simply be 3 minus R. Or actually, the, no, other way around, R minus 3. So if you have an ideal case where you have just three reactions, then um, you will have a determinacy, external determinacy of zero, and that is going to be uh, sort of an ideal case. It is a, that would be a stable, uh, that would be a truss that is externally stable and also determinant. Uh, but if you had something like two pin supports where R would be equal to four, then we would say that truss is uh, externally indeterminate to the first degree. And then internal de uh, determinacy, the internal determinacy is simply going to be the difference between the overall determinacy and the internal determinacy, or the external determinacy. So it's going to be the uh, overall uh, degree of indeterminacy minus the external, the external degree of indeterminacy. So what I mean by this is you can have trusses that um, determinacy can come in external or internal forms. So maybe I can draw a simple example. Yeah, let's look, I think this might, I think it might help if we look at a simple example of this. And let's see if we can um, find some trusses 
that are both externally and internally indeterminate. And hopefully we can use those to gain some appreciation for what these things represent. Okay, so uh, let's say we have a truss. Oh, that is something like this. First, let's look at a truss that's like this. Just a simple square truss. And let's go ahead and put two pin supports on this. So let's count first our number of, re uh, let's count our uh, reactions first. Now, in terms of reactions, it would have an X or, or a vertical reaction force and a horizontal reaction force on this pin, and a vertical reaction force and a horizontal reaction force on this pin. So uh, in this case, we would have a R equal to four, and our joints, now we don't count, uh, even though we draw these as pins or rollers, realize that each joint at the supports is simply just one joint. So we have a total of four joints. So J equals four. And then number of members, we have one, two, three, four, five. So M is equal to five. So we can apply these equations. And again, when I say treating this as a rigid body, what I mean is we could, uh, if we want to solve for the reactions, um, we can just ignore all of the internal uh, members of a trust, look at just its, treat it as just a single lump of matter and apply equilibrium to the entire thing and try to solve for all of our reaction forces. Now, if we have a, a nice ideal case where we, where we only have three reaction forces, we can solve for all of those. But in this case, we're not able to do that. So uh, what we would have, we actually, we would refer to this truss as, um, if we run through the external determinacy calculation, R minus three is equal to uh, four minus uh, three. So this is externally, indeterminate to the first degree. Uh, to the first degree. And then the internal determinacy the internal determinacy is simply going to be the subtraction of, okay, so the overall indeterminacy, remember, was going to be our, uh, or was going to be our 2j, or our, our m plus r minus the 2j. So that would mean we have m plus r minus 2j. So 4 plus 5 minus 2 times 8, or uh, sorry, 2 times uh, f uh, 4 there. minus two times four. So we have our overall indeterminacy. Minus our internal determinus, uh, degree of indeterminacy, which we found was one. So this comes to just, in this case, that comes to, let me actually label that again, that is the internal indeterminacy. the degree of indeterminacy. And so for here, um, or sorry, external to indeterminacy. Um, so we subtract again the uh, overall indeterminacy, we subtract the external indeterminacy from the overall indeterminacy. And in this case, we would simply get one minus one or uh, equal to zero. So this truss here, is, uh, has indeterminacy as follows. It has overall, it is in, overall indeterminate to the first degree. It is determinate internally. In other words, it has a, uh, 
it has a internal uh, determinacy of zero, so it is internally determinate. And we have external indeterminacy of the first degree. Of the first degree. Then uh, we can also have the other case where we have a truss that is uh, externally uh, determinate, but because of its it, because of how it is constructed, it is um, it is not able to uh, uh, you're not able to solve for all of the internal forces simply because of how the internal members are structured and arranged. And so that's going to be our next example. And I think there will be a, uh, on the homework, I will have you uh, work through some of these equations, find degrees of indeterminacy, etc. And the reason we're spending time on this is that it really, this really does go to the heart of a lot of the equations of structural analysis. Um, again, you can, we can look at this, uh, we, uh, in structural analysis, introductory structural analysis, we use trusses as a sort of a simplified example framework because on more complex frameworks like fixed frames, you can explore topics like determinacy and stability, but um, they are more complex by their nature. They have to be, they're always static, they're almost always statically indeterminate. And uh, it's, it is very useful to discuss some of these basic principles of determinacy and stability using a relatively simple uh, framework. Okay, so next, let's look at an example that would have, oh, that would have um, uh, external determinacy or would be externally determinate, but internally indeterminate. So, um, Often I don't draw the joints on trusses as circles just because they're kind of just implied. But in this case, I'm drawing a very special, um, I want to draw a very special uh, format. So let's call this uh, joint A, B, C, and D with a pin support and a roller support. Now, um, the reason I did, I'm drawing these on this one is because I'm purposely excluding a joint at the center here. And I'll just say the, uh, the truss members, uh, the truss members do not connect at the center. In this example. So in other words, if I were to look at them, um, uh, if I were to look at them from the edge, there, it actually wouldn't be a two a perfectly, a perfectly planar truss. So there would be, you know, two members going past each other, but it would be close enough that we could still approximate it as a plane truss. So these two members would be going past each other. They don't actually intersect anywhere at the center. They're just, uh, they're slightly out of plane to each other. So uh, let's look at this. So our R, like last time, is going, well, not like last time, our R is going to be equal to 3. So that means our external uh, determinacy, we have a, we can simply do R minus 3, and that equals 0. So that, that means this truss is externally uh, determinate. However, this truss will also be over uh, will also be overall indeterminate to some degree, and we can calculate that. The overall determinacy by just applying our m plus r and 2j equation. So our m, we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six members. So m is equal to six. R is equal to three as, as we saw before. And then um, m plus r minus two, oh, and j equals four. So m plus r minus two j, this would be equal to uh, six plus three minus uh, two times four, uh, two times four. Six plus three minus two times four. So, and that equals one. 
So this is, uh, the truss is overall uh, indeterminate to the first degree. And because we know that it is, that it has a, a degree of indeterminacy of zero externally, we got that just by looking at the reactions, uh, we can say then that the internal indeterminacy is the difference of the two. Uh, so this would be one minus zero or one. So this is indeterminate internally to the first degree. Uh, to the first degree. And again, the difference between external and internal determinacy is the external determinacy describes what, uh, to what degree uh, or how many unknowns you'll have left over when you treat the truss as a single rigid body, ignore all internal forces, or ignore all internal forces, and treat it as simply a lumped mass. And then when you do when you do that, and then um, to what to, uh, to uh, how you look at how many uh, reaction forces you will not be able to solve for. And in the ideal case where you have r is equal to three, then you have an externally determinate truss. Um, and then internal determinacy uh, reflects on or describes. Um, when you start actually applying method of joints, method of sections, and other or other methods to analyze the truss's internal forces, uh, that describes uh, how many you'll be unable to solve for. Um, and so, again, we have this combination of external and internal indeterminacy, and they add up to the total degree of indeterminacy for a truss. So, uh, questions on that? I know this is a bit esoteric, but I think this is pretty useful. Um, to explore some of the real fundamental topics of structural analysis. So any questions on this before we continue? Okay. So next I wanted to talk about uh, types of stability. And just like uh, determinacy, there are uh, externally and internally uh, stable and unstable trusses. And it breaks down along very similar manners. Along breaks down along very similar uh, criteria. So just like with uh, determinacy, stability can be an external or internal phenomenon. And we touched on this a bit looking at uh, whole frameworks earlier, but we'll uh, look at the particular case of just trusses. These are a bit easier to calculate in some cases. So external versus internal, not determinacy, but stability. external versus internal stability. So external stability, this refers to whether a truss is properly, is fully restrained, uh, treating it as a rigid body. Whether a truss is fully restrained in rigid body behavior. Uh, when acting as a rigid body. I, I suppose I could say as a single rigid body. So in other words, if you have a, okay, so the ideal, a, a nice case would be something like this. Consider something like this where you have a pin support and a roller support. 
And if we look at our reactions, we would have three reactions, an X and a Y here, and a Y. So if I try to move this thing to the left or to the right, uh, my horizontal reaction is going to restrain that. If I try to move this up or down, uh, these two vertical forces will resist that. And if I try to rotate the truss, these two forces will be capable of forming a couple and thus resisting moments. So this is externally stable. However, if I had a, a truss like this, imagine the same truss, except now just supported on uh, two roller supports, like this here. Well, if I try to move this thing vertically, I'll be fine because I have my two vertical forces. And if I try to apply a moment, if I go and try to rotate this, these two forces will be able to generate a couple to resist that rotation. Oh, be able to resist that rotation. However, if I try to move this thing to the left or to the right, there is nothing preventing someone from uh, hooking this thing to the back of their truck, hauling it away and selling it by the pound. So this is externally unstable. And then you can have the uh, correlating case, the internal stability. So internal stability, I would describe, the, I mean, I could describe this many ways, but uh, perhaps I could succinctly describe it as um, internal stability is whether a truss will maintain its shape when, uh, when cut from its supports or isolated from its supports or removed from its supports. Uh, whether a truss can maintain its shape when removed from its supports. And we'll look at some examples. So imagine you have a truss, so we'll have this, we'll look at stable and then we'll look at unstable. So let's say you have a truss like this two pin supports. So let's say I have a truss on two pin supports. However, I then come along and remove it from its pin supports, and I see what, would ha what will happen to the shape of the truss. Well, this truss is made of just uh, simple locked lock together triangles. Uh, this shape is going to be stable. And so, uh, if I, in other words, if I don't have some way of easily distorting it without cause, without, if I want to distort this truss, I'm going to have to fracture one of the members or substantially deform one of the members. So no matter what way I try to bend or twist this thing, or if I try to pull on this, the internal members here, the web members will resist that and show all the cord members. Uh, no matter what I try to do th with this, this will have internal stability. So this is internally stable. However, imagine a truss like this. Oh, let's say I have something like this. Imagine a truss composed of two triangles uh, that simply meet at one joint at the middle. Now, um, let's see, let's look at the overall degree of indeterminacy, for example. Um, or let's apply the equations here, so M is equal to what? M is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Our number of joints is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And our, um, and our number of reactions is equal to 4. So uh, our uh, M plus R minus 2J Uh, this is going to be, uh, this is then, that's just going to be 10 minus, uh, not equals 2j, minus 2j. Uh, that's going to come to zero. So in other words, this truss is overall stable. If I have this thing nice and rested on supports, it's not going to, it's not going to move when I apply a load in any direction. However, imagine if I then go and cut it from its supports. 
So I have a pin joint here and then just our two triangles with pin joints like this, something like that. When I cut, remove it from its supports, now I'm freely able to rotate the two pieces with respect to each other because there is only a single pin joint and we don't, uh, only a single pin joint joining them or uh, connecting them and it's no longer connected to its supports. So this is uh, exter or internally unstable. Again, I can cut, I can when I remove this shape, when I remove this truss from its supports, it's not able to maintain its same shape. So another way of looking at it is this, this is a stable and determinate truss. However, it relies on its supports in order to maintain its shape. So uh, I would say that the, I would then refer to this truss as internally unstable. All right, any questions on stability? Okay. Good? Uh-huh. Uh, so the question is, if it is it only determined if it's, uh, so the question is, uh, how do you determine this? Is it only, does it only occur if there are, is only one pin joint? Uh, that is probably going to be your main case. If you ever have two, uh, two uh, nice cords connecting, you're probably not going to have an internally unstable truss. The way to figure this out is really to just imagine separating it and seeing if you can freely rotate different pieces with respect to each other. It, so there isn't necessarily a simple equation you can apply. It really is a matter of overall behavior. Uh, just like you can have uh, trusses that have, rea you can also have reactions that um, based on their pure number, you might think, based on the just the pure number of reactions, you might think that it, it would be externally stable. But if they are all laid out in certain manners, it's possible to still have a, a um, it's possible to still have an externally unstable truss even if the math, the m plus r minus 2j, suggests that you should be able to have an uh, externally stable truss. And that the case for that is if you have uh, parallel reactions. So I would like to maybe uh, look at that really quickly. So imagine you have a truss like this. Um, so imagine you have a truss like this, and let's look at our equations. So uh, our number of members is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, so m is equal to 7. Our number of joints, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. j is equal to 5. And our number of reaction forces is 3. So Overall, if when I do m plus r, uh, well, you can see that m plus r is equal to 2j. Um, so that's simply because we did because this uh, 10 plus uh, sub, 3, 7 plus 3 is equal to 2 pl uh, times 5. So 10 equals 10. So by math, by our equations, it suggests that this truss is stable. But this is actually not the case. And the reason for that is that we have three parallel reactions. If all of your reactions are parallel, um, you end up getting a system that even that uh, uh, these equations apply only if uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, reactions that are not parallel or concurrent. So if all reactions are parallel or concurrent, And if you're having trouble visualizing why this is unstable, again, I have no horizontal restraint on this truss. So if I try to pull this to the right, it's just going to go rolling on down the road. So if all reactions are parallel or concurrent, meaning their lines of action meet at a single point, uh, the truss will be unstable even if the math predicts otherwise.
And it's very similar to this case here. Um, you might find that your uh, that mathematically this is a stable truss, but you can see that there is clearly a mechanism for rotation. So uh, often there are some times you simply have to determine the uh, whether it's externally or internally stable just by inspection. You have to look at it and see whether there are any kind whether you can just sort of uh, haul it away by applying horizontal force or whether you can apply uh, whether you can rotate it. Um, about a single point of rotation. Does that kind of answer that? So there are cases where you have to do this by inspection. Um, does that kind of answer that? Okay, good. All right, next I would like to briefly discuss types of trusses. So I know today is a bit of a grab bag, but I'm trying to cover uh, the rest of my uh, basic truss theory that I, want to get, that I want to get through. So I'd next like to look at types of trusses. And there are three types of trusses. There's three ways we can uh, classify them. Let's look at types of trusses or classifying trusses. So classifying trusses. Well, the first type of, there are three types of, uh, of ways we can classify trusses, at least planar trusses. And uh, so this is, I'm still talking about planar or two-dimensional trusses. And the first is a simple truss. A simple truss is just a single triangular frame. A frame made of a single triangle. So this is kind of a, uh, you'll almost never encounter this. In fact, actually, let me, let me make that a little bigger to make clear that I'm talking about a frame. So let's say you have a uh, truss ABC with a pin and a roller support. Uh, this is a, it's called a simple truss because it is in fact a very simple truss. It's made of just a single triangle and it is, um, and as you probably know from prior experience, uh, triangles are generally considered the most stable structural form. Um, so that is a simple truss. You almost never encounter one in the real world. Then we have compound trusses. which are trusses simply made from a direct combination of simple trusses. So they're made from a combination of simple trusses, made by combining simple trusses. So everything is still a triangle. So still all triangles. So if you have something like this, This is uh, what we refer to as a what we refer to as a compound truss. It's a, it's a lot more complex than this uh, than our simple truss, but it is still just uh, it's more complicated than that. But it's still a series of triangles. It's really just a bunch of these put together. And finally, you can have complex trusses, which is where we have shapes other than triangles. Uh, so a complex truss. An example of this would be, imagine you had something like, oh, I don't know, something, let's see. Let's 
So this would still be able to maintain its uh, overall shape if I removed it from its supports because of our, well, actually, no, it wouldn't, would it? Um, this, these have pins, so if I, if I removed it from its supports, this thing would just, this end would just kind of flop down. Um, so you could have this, or, so you could have a case where something isn't fully restrained without its supports, or you could have something like, um, the one we looked at previously, where you have members going through each other. So imagine something like this. And I'm going to draw the pins here to uh, illustrate that we don't have pins at these internal connections, at these internal joints. So something like this, um, again, we would have a shape kind of, a, of a, almost like a parallelogram here. And so, again, these don't, don't join up here. If you have members going through each other, it's a pretty good sign that you're dealing with a compound truss. So here you have just a, a square element or a square bay, I might say. And here you have members passing through each other. If you have either of them, you have a complex truss. Passing through or in reality behind each other. Uh, each other. All right, and finally, I'd like to look at some special member conditions. And namely, I'd like to explore zero force members. So in an example last time, or something we were uh, something we were looking at, I briefly in pa in passing uh, mentioned that we knew that we would know that a, that a certain member would have a zero force, would have zero forces in it, would have zero force in it. So if you have, and this comes out of basic statics, if a uh, if two parallel members, or sorry, two not parallel but two concurrent members. concurring or you might say continuous members are joined by a single other uh, member. By a single third member. That member will carry zero force. unless there is a load applied directly to that joint. Uh, directly to the joint. And what I mean by this is that imagine you have a member, two members like this meeting at a joint, and then you have uh, some just other single member coming into this. Um, let's say this was points A, B, C, and D. Well, A, B, and B, C are concurrent, are the two concurrent or continuous members I'm talking about. They maintain the same slope all the way along. They don't if they change slope, then they are not concurrent. Their lines of action do not overlap. Um, but the, and then in this case, member BD would be a zero force member. It will carry no load. And why is this? Well, imagine if I take a, if I were to, to uh, do a summation of moments about point B. So if I do a summation of moments about point B, because if I do, oh, let's uh, perhaps isolate that joint in a free body diagram. I would have joint B, and then I would have some force BC, and some force AB, and finally the, the uh, third force BD. 
Well, if I do a summation of moments about B, both AB and BC will have, um, well, actually, even this one will have, uh, I probably don't want to do moments about B. Let's say I just had some other point E along ABC's line of action, along that line. But if I do that, uh, some moments about E, uh, neither this point nor, uh, neither this force nor this force will, gener will generate a moment about E, but uh, FBD will have some uh, moment arm. So some moment arm D. And then there's nothing, but if there are no other forces uh, applied to that joint, this would simply equal zero. And so then I can, so either D or FBD has to equal zero. And if I know that the moment arm is not equal to zero because I'm where I'm summing moments about, I can conclude that FBD is equal to zero. So that fundamentally is a zero force member. And you can also have cases of um, many zero force members sort of causing other zero force members. So in, let's look at this one here, for example. Actually, let me, um, let me look at uh, another example of maybe more, well, something a little more complex. So let's investigate something a little bit more complex just to see how zero for the zero force member condition can it sometimes almost cascade through a truss. So imagine you have something like this. Oh, something like this. Um, actually, let's see, is that going to cascade at all? Well, no, in this case, okay, maybe if I have to, I would actually have to draw it more like that, I suppose. So imagine I have something like this. Well, I can first conclude that this is a zero force member, so it carries no force because this joint here uh, meets that can reach the concurrent member condition. And then without this one, this one is a zero force member. Without this one, this member here is a zero force member. Without this one, without this one here, this is a zero force member. And without this one, well, I guess this one is our only one that would not be a zero force member. So I would actually have four zero force members in this truss. And then there's one other special member condition I'd like to mention very quickly and then we'll be done. And that is the case of uh, intersecting members, intersecting continuous members. So if you have, imagine you have two, um, two sets of concurrent members like this. And so this is this is one continuous line of action. This is one continuous straight line of action. And let's say you had you labeled these A, B, C, D, E. The, the force in this member will be equal to the force in this member, and the force in this member will be equal to the force in this member. So in other words, FBD or FBC would equal FCD and FAC. And this also comes out of statics and balance of moments. FAC is equal to FAE. So those are some special uh, member forces that I'd like you to be aware of as we move forward with our uh, discussion of trusses and learning how to solve for the internal forces. All right, that'll do it for today. I uh, hope you found this enjoyable or a little bit informative. Again, as a, uh, as a review, what we've done today is we've gone and uh, looked deeply at the equations of indeterminacy and stability and learned how to determine or how to find whether a truss is both externally and internally determinate and stable. And as a, as a review, again, you can have a truss that is uh, externally or internally or even both uh, stable or determinate. And then we looked at how to classify trusses in terms of uh, simple compound and complex trusses. And finally, we, look, we finished up looking at some uh, special member conditions, including zero force members and equal force members. 
So if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Uh, otherwise, I look for I'll see you all again in the next lecture. Um, of course, please like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. And uh, regardless, I hope to see you all again soon in the next lecture where we can where we'll continue our exploration of trusses, uh, looking at how to find uh, mathematically the internal forces inside trusses. So that'll do it all for now. I hope that you found this enjoyable or a little bit informative. I will see you all then. And as always, thank you.